So uh, good evening. Um, I hope everyone is staying safe um, tonight. So um, also would like to um, I would like to say good evening to most of our viewers in India and also here in the Philippines. And good morning if you have some viewers in Europe or other parts of the world. Uh, I'm Philippe Dembley Jr. I'm an uh, anatomic and clinical pathologist from the Philippine Heart Center. And I trained in that center also uh, with a one-year fellowship in cardiovascular pathology. And I've been in the center also since 20 or since 2009 as a attending pathologist. So that's nearly about more than 10 years. So my talk is basically part of my limited experience of this uh, cardiac pseudoneoplasm and also some of the case report, case series and review articles over the past 10 years. So um, in general, cardiac tumors, whether benign or malignant, are really rare. And majority of these are benign neoplasm. So we, we, we actually see few of malignant process. But the main concern basically of cardiac neoplasm is their mass forming effect. Of course, with the malignancy, they can also metastasize. So in this case, the cardiac pseudoneoplasms are even rare. They are classified as cardiovascular pseudoneoplasm because their neoplastic nature are not fully elucidated. Some of them are believed to be neoplastic, but there are debates whether they are also inflammatory or hamartomatous in growth. So basically, we do not have a lot of articles about cardiovascular neoplasm. This one was published in 2010, about 10 years ago, by... Dylan Miller and Henry Tazilar um, in the Archives of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine. Here they discuss only about five pseudoneoplastic lesions, the inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, the hamartoma of mature cardiac myocyte, the mice or your mesothelial monocytic cardiac excrescences, your calcified amorphous tumor, and lipomatous hypertrophy of the atrial septum. Another significance of this um, lecture is for proper identification because we do not have, we do not want to, to, to provide aggressive surgical intervention and even aggressive medical treatment for these lesions. Uh, basically, the objective of this lecture is to describe some of the tumor like or pseudoneoplasms of the heart with focus on the gross morphology histopathologic features, and more importantly, the differential diagnosis. And we will also mention some of those immunohistochemistry studies to differentiate this from malignant, counter, malignant tumors. And since the last publication was 10 years ago, we can also cite some of the current perspective of this cardiac pseudoneoplasms based on the recent case report case series and review articles. So I will, the lesions in focus will be the first five, which was also discussed in that article, the inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors, the mesothelial monocytic cardiac excrescence, the lipomatous hypertrophy of the atrial septum, the hamartoma of mature cardiac myocytes and calcified amorphous tumor um, in this sequence. But I will also include the three more lesions, the papillary fibroelastoma, the cystic tumor of the atrioventricular node, and histiocytoid cardiomyopathy. So this is basically from my limited experience as well as some articles uh, during the past 10 years. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the clinical implication basically is this pseudoneoplasm are, are associated with significant mortality and morbidity by valvular function, by cardiac conduction, and electrical activity. Of course, they can easily lead to obstruction of blood flow and embolization, 
And a few of these can actually mimic malignancy in terms of clinical presentation and even by histopathologic features. So I will first discuss the inflammatory myof myofibroblastic tumor, or IMT. Uh, this tumor actually is, is not uncommon because we can actually see this in many other organs like your liver, lungs, or uterus. However, the presence of inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor in the heart is still very controversial. Um, in, the, in the previous article, it is said that uh, there is still a debate whether this is a true neoplasm or, or not. So between that period, I could not find any articles that fully elucidated the neoplastic nature of this tumor. So some would say this is also an inflammatory or, or reactive process. So we will include here. So basically, if the tumor is excised completely, uh, the gross appearance would be soft, translucent, but there are varying textural variation. They can also be fleshy or fibrous, um, as in this case here. So on low power magnification, we can see the prominence of infl inflammation on the different parts of the tumor. So they varies. And we can also see that the tumor has some loose areas or less cellular areas and some compact, uh, compact cellular areas. But the inflammation are prominent and consists mainly of your uh, lymphocytes, plasma cells, granulocytes, and also the presence of eosinophils can suggest that this is an inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor. Um, in this photo also, we can see that the cells these are myofibroblastic cells, which can be spindle, rounded, or epithelioid. And I think in this in this slides here, there is some low level of atypia, but in general, the atypia here is not significant, and the mitosis is only about less than two per 10 high power field. So the cells, the myofibroblastic cells, are described as elong having elongated nuclei, vesicular chromatin, and prominent nucleoli. And of course, here we can see this myofibroblastic lesions or cells are positive with against actin and vimentin here. This is actin and vimentin. Also, they are positive uh, with desmin and smooth muscle actin. And we can see here the, the inflammation. So basically this tumor has no predilection to specific chamber, but they can also be present as a polypoid mass or, or they can arise from endocardial surfaces. One thing that this makes tumor um, probably a reactive or inflammatory as the name implies because they present with syndrome like fever, malaise, weight loss, and thrombocytosis. And also, they can elicit the so-called cytokine storm or cytokine surge because of the, they can release the, we have the so-called inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor interleukin-6 release. And mainly the concern here is obstruction, but they can also embolize to different parts of the body. And so it is important that the surgical intervention be done properly to prevent any um, symptoms or complications. Your differential diagnosis here would be your myxofibrosarcoma, also a very rare cardiac tumor, your low-grade fibromyxosarcoma. But this two, this two tumors does not have any inflammation or significant inflammation to contrast with your IMT. And the blood vessels here basically are are more curvilinear compared to your IMT. The other one, of course, is myxoma. I think from my experience, we can see myxoma with many inflammation, but of course, it is important to check for your myxoma cells and uh, I mean, quartz of myxoma cells and the perivascular ring. So in this study, this is a study in our center 
they were able to describe at least six INT tumors or inflammatory myofibrastic tumors. And they tested this for proliferation markers like PP53, BCL2, and KI67. The PP53 and BCL2 mainly shows less than 1% expression, but the KI67 is about 6 up to 12%. But overall, um, even with this proliferation marker like the K67 higher, about 12%, the overall outcome is not unfavorable or the behavior of this tumor is generally benign. So our next tumor, our next uh, lesions is your mesothelial monocytic incidental cardiac excrescence. So this, this lesion was first identified by Lutringer in 1990, described as uh, a tumor resembling histocytoid hemangioma with increase in mesothelial differentiation. So grossly, uh, this is described as gray-white, to dark red to brown and associated with thrombus. It can be very microscopic, but it can grow to up to three centimeter in diameter. Usually in, in a day-to-day -day pathology work, this is submitted by your cardiovascular surgeon together with a valve specimen or any other open heart surgery. Maybe they are curious if this is uh, a very big thrown by a vegetation or probably really a, a tumor. So um, there are theories about this, but the overall agreement for this development is that this is an aggregation of histocytes, your mesothelial cells and fibrin, similar to how you do the cell block. So it is really a, a product of a mechanical intervention in your um, thoracic area. But there is some pathogenesis. This is supposed to be initiated by suction catheter tips and other surgical indoluminal instrument and sometimes occurs spontaneously when a mesothelium line space is entered or opened. So to differentiate this, so usually this is your mice. Um, so we can see here in the slides, uh, two groups of cells already. There's a gland forming and uh, sheets of cells. This is a better magnification. You can see glandular cells here and uh, sheets of cells. So these cells here are positive for CD, sorry, positive for cytokeratin like AE13, while the sheets, cells here in sheets are positive for CD68. Now, to further illustrate that, we basically have two types of cells here, the, the histocytic cells, which are um, uh, arranged in sheets mainly, and your taller columnar or cuboidal cells. So your histocytoid cells or histocytic cells is positive for CD68, and your taller cuboidal or columnar cells is positive for CK, um, also for calretinin as well. Um, but there are variations in the appearance of your mice. Like in these slides, they're all up appearing very solid. So these two cells are, are seem to be admixed with one another here. Now, this one is a more developed. The, the polar columnar or cuboidal cells are arranged in tubules or glands. Um, easily, easy to differentiate from your histocytoid cells in the background. In this in this pattern, the, the taller columnar or cuboidal cells ten, tend to be arranged in sinusoids. And now this one, this is more of a immunohistochemistry. So they are positive for AE13, cytokeratin, EMA, and other um, epithelial markers, while the background cells are positive for CD68. Now they, they, they they performed um, electron microscope studies here. So the, the histocytoid cells here is, is, well, in microscopically, if closer magnification, they are round to oval with well-defined nuclei and prominent no 
prominent nuclear groups and occasional nucleoli. And so on electron microscopic exam, they are typically uh, the, the structural morphology or the structural features are very similar to histocytes with convoluted nuclei, prominent nucleoli, and uh, the cytoplasm is rich in reticulin and surface pseudopodia. Now, this taller columnar or cuboidal cells, they also studied this in um, electron microscope, and they would also show similar findings with your mesothelial cells having some intermediate uh, filaments and surface microvilli with well-developed desmosomes. So the theory basically is that this is of histocytic in origin, both proven by immunohistochemistry and electron microscope. And this is really of mesothelial in origin that can be proven both by your immunohistochemistry and your electron microscope studies. Uh, you can also see occasional uh, inflammatory cells within the mice. And um, basically, the main differential diagnosis here is your localized mesothelial hyperplasia. But your mice does not really have blood vessels, prominent blood vessels, or supporting stroma, which is the universal finding in localized mesothelial hyperplasia. So that, that effectively differentiate this from your localized mesothelial hyperplasia. You can see this in many cardiac chamber, uh, in cardiac valves, in pericardial sac, ascending aorta, and even in bronchial biopsy, probably, and endomyocardial biopsy. Um, so basically, this is described as free floating by the surgeon. So floating in your surgical field and sometimes simply like, sometimes described as possible contaminants but they will submit this and the, this features would be present in the microscope. The, the other term for this is, uh, or rather the old term is your, your nodular histocytic slash mesothelial hyperplasia, which is not a good term because this is not really a mesothelial hyperplasia, evidently by lacking your supporting stroma and blood vessels. Now for, for these features here, um, with when the tall columnar or cuboidal cells are well developed or they form prominent tubular or glandular cells, this can effectively mimic a metastatic carcinoma or metastatic adenocarcinoma. So for, from my experience, this is also the most important thing to rule out. However, uh, some of the authors, I encountered two articles saying that the if even if this lesion is proven to be a mice from your immunohistochemistry studies, we cannot entirely rule out the presence of concomitant uh, metastatic adenocarcinoma like in this case report here. So still, it's important to work out this patient with other diagnostic like maybe a tumor markers or other imaging to really rule out the absence of or really rule out your metastatic adenocarcinoma from elsewhere. Next lesion is your lipomatous hypertrophy of the atrial septum. Again, this can be mistaken for malignancy, um, especially by imaging. And this is more of developmental aberrancy and rather than an acquired neoplasm. The pathogenesis described here is that during your embryogenesis, your right and left atria divides by progression of infolding of the roof of the upper and posterior wall of the rudimentary common chamber along the midline. Your mesodermal tissue are then drawn into the wall of the primitive atrial septum during the process and pockets of intrap adipose tissue remains after the heart is fully formed. And thus you develop this lipomatous hypertrophy of the atrial septum, or the LHAS. Obviously, this is prominent in your right atrium, and this is age-dependent, most commonly seen in patients above 50 years of age. And there is arguably a weak association with obesity. Uh, grossly, this is very similar to your fatty tissue on the cut section, 
with, with probably more pronounced fine fibrous tissue. But take note, there is no true capsule here. In, in, and this will be later on noted in the microscopic examination. So here, we can see there is no through capsule, and they are composed mainly of mature um, fatty tissue and both uh, your, your brown fat and um, mature, mature fatty tissue. Now, the, the main concern here is in differential diagnosis with some malignancy. Because they don't have the well-delineated capsule, they seem, they seem to be merging imperceptibly with your cardiac myocytes. And your hypertrophic cardiac myocyte would usually shows enlargement and squaring of the individual nuclei. And if, if, if the section is transverse and does not show your cytoplasm of your cardiac myocyte, this nuclei can mimic a malignancy and can be mistaken for lipoblast. Sometimes this lesion can also interrupt some of the ganglion cells. And as we know, some of the ganglion cells also exhibit um, moderate degree of nuclear pleomorphism and conspicuous nucleoli. And this can be mistaken for malignancy as well. So as I mentioned earlier, this is older, usually seen in patient older than 50, although you can see this in, uh, also in children. It is more common in women and generally asymptomatic until, um, until a certain level of growth. So the presentation can be a supraventricular tachycardia or SVT. And also this is one of the very rare benign lesions um, in the mediastinum that can present with severe vena cava syndrome. So here they seem, they seem to be merging with your uh, mature cardiac myocyte. And if this mature, mature cardiac myocyte are hypertrophic, that can mimic for some lipoblast or other malignancy. So like in here, this is an interrupt cardiac myocytes showing some pleomorphic hyperchromatic nuclei. And if not taken properly or not sampled properly, this can be mistaken for malignancy. So as I mentioned earlier, the, the main differential diagnosis here is a cardiac lipoma, another very rare, but this is a true tumor. And of course, you have to identify a true capsule here to be uh, mentioned for lipoma. And of course, your liposarcoma, uh, this, can, this can mimic liposarcoma, again, because of those intra nuclei of your mature or hypertrophic cardiac myocytes and even ganglion cells. Fortunately for the imaging, your 2D echo, this, this lipomatous hypertrophy of the atrial septum, it can show the typical bilobe dumbbell appearance. Also, even in your CT scan, they can present with your typical fat tissue signal characteristic. And in MRI, they would also show the characteristic fat suppression sequence. So, this is again in our center, we, we had a case report, but this is not the lipomatous hypertrophy of your right atrial septum. But it was one of the differential diagnoses when we were trying to elucidate this uh, lesion. But in our case here, we actually identify a true capsule. So we effectively ruled out lipomatous hypertrophy of the atrial septum. Next lesion is your calcified amorphous tumor. So uh, for me, I have not actually encountered this personally as an actual case, but only as a study slide. Sorry. So perhaps one of our uh, panel here can fully expand here with their experience about this specific uh, pseudoneoplasm. So grossly, this is a conglomerated, described as a conglomerated red-brown, dry, clot-like material with tendency to crumble. It is also choky in appearance and focally mineralized calcification can be obvious on the outside of the tumor. And this may require the calcification prior to processing. Again, the presentation clinically and the imaging can raise, this lesion can raise for suspicion for malignancy especially with a differential diagnosis. 
So histologically or macroscopically or microscopically, it would show a central areas of calcification and the outside is covered by fibrin material here. This is, for example, this is the anchoring um, cardiac myocyte. There are areas of your calcification and outside are your fibrin. And sometimes the periphery of the tumor would also show significant inflammation. Since the center of this tumor is your calcification or your calcium, the, the outside fibrin, the significance of this, this can emboli to different parts of your body. And this is the, uh, the, the danger of this tumor here. So again, you can describe here as a degenerating fibrin with central nodular, nodular calcium deposits, or sometimes they look like an osseous metaplasia and some mild inflammation on the outside. Sometimes also the fibrin can become very organized and they can form fibroblasts, capillaries, and myxoid stroma. You can also see hemosiderin deposits and cholesterol cleft. So here they can, this can occur in any parts of the cardiac valves, but the most common location is your mitral valves. It can grow up to nine centimeter. And again, the symptoms is the embolic phenomenon. It can also cause shortness of breath or topnia. Um, so we, although this is basically benign, this is one of the few um, pseudoneoplasm that can recur. And even during complete excision, sometimes some of this, calcium or calcified deposits can, re can remain within the area. And although this, what, this will not really present with any symptoms, even if the residual calcium is not fully, it's not again fully excised. Um, so here again, this are the center of your tumor here with uh, calcification and some fibrin perhaps on the outside. So this are the center of the tumor and again the fibrin. The fibrin here become very organized already with some uh, blood vessels and capilla or capillaries. Your differential diagnosis here varied from osteosarcoma, probably very rare in the heart. I have not seen osteosarcoma um, intracardia. Your calcified myxoma, which we can rule out if we have to sample the lesion properly. We have to see the myxoma cells at some, at some, in some areas. Your mural thrombi is also a differential diagnosis. And they are pretty much similar to your non-infectious thrombotic endocarditis. Now with this calcified amorphous tumor, the initiating factor leading to this fibrin aggregation as a reason for this tendency to form and to mummify and to undergo this trophic calcification is still not clear. So this is probably more of a, um, again, a reactive process. Next one is your hamartoma of your mature cardiac myocyte or HMCM. This was first described in Japan in 1988 and again, with the presence of this tumor and imaging, this is suspected to be a cardiac fibroma, a rhabdomyoma, or even an invasive malignancy. The most common location here is in the wall of your ventricle. And sometimes if, if a biopsy is taken, because this is composed of some hypertrophic uh, cardiac myocyte with nuclear polymorphism, um, this can be interpreted um, as a fro in the frozen section as a malignancy. And then this is often, this is sometimes uh, a point of a disbelief between the surgeon and the pathologist when the whole section is excised and diagnosed as hamartoma, mature cardiac myocyte. So grossly, this is the entire tumor here. They are paler than your surrounding myocardium. I think this is one of the residual myocardium here. So they are actually paler compared to this area. Uh, they have a fibrous texture on cut section. They resemble infarction. I think this is what the authors is telling us here. And this is actually areas of fibrosis on microscopic examination. They are described to be circumscribed, but uh, 
have a poorly defined border. So they are mainly present in the left ventricle. About 90% is present in left ventricle. Microscopically, they are very similar to your hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we have myocyte hypertrophy, uh, enlargement and squaring of the individual nuclei. There are myocyte um, disorganization or disarray. We can see here, even at this magnification, some of the enlarged nuclei, very pleomorphic, and with, with, with an admix adipose tissue and blood vessels here. You can see here the thick-walled arteries and dilated venules here. Um, so here we have, they did here some trichrome stain showing the interstitial fibrosis. This is also your elastic stain showing some of the blood vessels here. The blood vessels, this is CD31 showing the mesothelial lining of the blood vessels. This is a desmin showing the positivity of your hypertrophic disorganized cardiac myocyte. And this is your smooth muscle actin showing the smooth muscle layers in your dilated venules, your blood vessels. Again, another section with your hypertrophic cardiac myocyte arranged in this array, interspheres with dilated venules, blood dilated thick-walled arteries, and um, I think there are some adipose tissue here. Okay. So again, the main differential diagnosis here is your rhabdomyoma. But uh, of course, your rhabdomyoma is almost always associated with tuberous sclerosis, while hamartoma, mature cardiac myocyte, is not. Your hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, now to differentiate this from hypercardio hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, this one does not really form a specific or discrete lesion compared to hamartoma, a mature cardiac myocyte. But um, this is, again, not easy to differentiate. And of course, this one is, is associated with your germline mutation. So you probably need to do uh, more work up to differentiate this from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And also another differential diagnosis is your histiocytoid cardiomyopathy, which I will discuss a bit later. Well, th this become a differential diagnosis because this is also a differential diagnosis of your hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So um, in short, this can, um, this can be also confusing for both lesions as well. Now, this hamartoma of cardiac myocyte is again one of the pseudoneoplasm that can recur. It can recur, but very low uh, degree of recurrence. And again, because of the suspicion for malignancy, this is very important to differentiate with, with, other, with one another. So in our center, we have the same similar case about um, three years ago. So this, the presentation of this patient is episode of cyanosis with difficulty of breathing or chest pain. And effectively, we, we signed this out as um, hamartoma of mature cardiac myocyte. This was actually the first in our center for this case, um, but probably um, in, in other center, they have this lesion as well. Now, um, this was not included. This was not discussed in in the in that article in the archives of pathology ten years ago, but in the 2015 classification of uh, tumors of the heart, the pap the papillary fibroelastoma was included in the section of tumor like lesions. So there, sorry, sorry for that. So there are debates whether this is uh, really a true neoplasm. Of course, in our standard textbook, this was also included as a true neoplasm, a benign uh, neoplasm of the um, intracardia um, or, or located in the heart. But the debate is whether this is a, new, a neoplasm, uh, a hamartomatous growth, or a reactive process. So your papillary fibroelastoma is, is described as your benign endocardial papillary growth that histologically resembles your lumbar excrescence usually located in your aortic valve. They, they resemble actually your C-anemone 
And the theory for the development of papillary fibroelastoma is this is due to successive organization of your fibrin deposit. And uh, the papillary fronts is due to exposure or a repeated exposure of the lesions to hemodynamic stress of a flowing blood. Okay, so that's this. So the, the, the main significance of this is that it can emboli, especially with the papillary fronts here. It can develop, the patient can present with syncope or transient ischemic attack. And if some of this lesion prolapses to your coronaries, it can cause chest pain. So they are grossly described as soft rounded nodule that expand when placed in your uh, uh, fluid like this one here. So basically, they are very similar to your C anemone. They can be present in your aortic valve, mitral valve, or even in your left ventricular endocardium, and very rare in your tricuspid valve. So this would appear like a, here, a amorphous, like a fibrin material surrounded by your uh, layers of mesothelial cells. Now, in... The main differential diagnosis here is your lumbell excrescence. Um, there, are, there are authors who said that we cannot actually differentiate um, papillary fibroelastoma from lumbell excrescence, although they mentioned that papillary fibroelastoma has several layers of mesothelial cells, while your lumbell excrescence usually have a single layer. But they said it's difficult to differentiate from that criteria alone. By location, your papillary fibroelastoma should be located um, in many parts of, your, of the heart, while your lumbar excrescence should be located basically at the site of closure of the valve because this is just a product of um, endothelial damage in that area, in the endocardium. But um, maybe later we can have more discussion on how really to differentiate the two uh, the two, I mean, the lumbar expresses versus papillary fibroelastoma. So my discussion for fibroelastoma is just short as this is only included here because of that particular classification. Next tumor, next lesion is your cystic tumor of your atrioventricular node. The older term for this is your mesothelioma of the AV node. And unfortunately, the most common presentation here is sudden death. So most likely, this is an autopsy case. Basically, the pathogenesis for this is that they originate during embryogenesis of the heart and is derived from congenital rest of your endodermal origin or ultimobranchial heterotropic elements similar to the solid rest of your thyroid. So this, this is more of a result of dilatation of your cystic space rather than cellular replications, indicating that this is not, this is not really a neoplasm, and basically there's an absence of mitosis. So grossly, they are about, they can range from two millimeter to two centimeter in diameter, multicystic when cut section, and of course they are located at the AV node. So this is the cross section here. They're made of a multi-cystic uh, structures. Um, the, the, the lining can range from squamoid to transitional epithelium, and they can be filled with um, calcification or luminal debris. Here, these are the cystic lining cells, and they are positive for cytokeratin, AE13, and epithelial membrane antigen. Sorry. Here, a closer magnification here. Uh, the lining can be squamoid or sometimes flattened, flat cuboidal cells. But similar, similarly, they contain keratin and some calcification and sometimes some clear cells, occasional clear cells resembling the sebaceous gland. And But we, we do not see here basically smooth, uh, clear-cut smooth muscles no evidence of mitosis, no atypia. So positive for CK, the lining cells, again, CAM5.2, AE13, 34B12, CK56, EMA, 
and there is a minimal K67 expression. So the differential diagnosis here is um, actually varied from exoma. The, it is, it is um, the differential diagnosis here as myxoma is basically based on the presentation and imaging perhaps rather than the um, histomorphologic features. But other differential diagnoses include your bronchogenic cyst, your mesothelial cyst, your teratoma, uh, of course, because of the presence of, the, of those keratin and squamous lining epithelium, uh, an ectopic thyroid, probably because some of the cells would, would resemble some of the thyroid follicular cells. Again, the histocytoid cardiomyopathy and metastatic carcinoma, if those cells, um, like they would, if there would be a, pro, a predominance of your clear cells in those um, cystic spaces. So the last lesion we have here is our histocytoid cardiomyopathy. This is actually extremely rare um, lesions in the heart. And again, the presentation is um, sudden death or um, fatal arrhythmia. The old term for this is an oncocytic cardiomyopathy or Purkinje's cell hamartoma. So this is an autopsy case here. We can see uh, grossly the appearance would be a rounded endocardial nodule, usually located in your ventricles. So this is the appearance. So yellowish rounded small nodules. And then uh, uh, later, uh, uh, I mean, uh, in a higher magnification showing some a bit translucent nodular with light yellow um, surface. So microscopically, they are defined. The cells is made up of clusters of your large polygonal histocytoid my myocytes. This is the lesion here. This is the this is your normal myocytes, and this is the um, the cardiomyopathy cells, histocytoid cardiomyopathy cells. The nuclei are round, oval, with um, evident nucleoli, and you can actually observe this in all layers of the cell. So. The, they can be infiltrated sometimes. Here again. So the cells here are believed to be transformed myocytes. They are like metaplastic or transformed myocyte to Purkinje cells with accumulation of mitochondria. So this is the reason why they are called oncocytoid uh, cardiomyopathy. They probably present a bit of an oncocyte and granular cytoplasm in some areas here because of the accumulation of those um, cell or cellular organelles here. So this is again a portion of your histocytoid cardiomyopathy and here I think they are interspheres in between those um, cells, uh, cardiac myocytes. So this cell is positive for um, myoD1, muscle-specific actin and myoglobin. This one is desmin positive. So these are the desmin positive cells. This is an anti-mitochondrial antibody signifying or confirming the presence of your mitochondria. This is your myoD1. Uh, this is your uh, muscle-specific actin here. And again, another uh, for muscle specific actin here. Sorry, this is our myoglobulin. So the, your main differential diagnosis here for histocytoid cardiomyopathy is your hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, usually from Pompe's disease, which is um, a glycogen storage disease. So like in this case report, they, um, the initial diagnosis here is uh, cardiomyopathy in Pompe's disease. And the, I mean, the initial impression here is a histocytoid cardiomyopathy, which is a my, mitochondrial disease. But eventually with further studies, I think with molecular um, profiling, they were able to differentiate the cardiomyopathy in Pompe's disease versus histocytoid cardiomyopathy. But of course, they do not offer any specific 
histologic appearance that would differentiate the two. Um, basically, that's the uh, lecture. So I, in summary, I discuss the cardiac pseudoneoplasm, uh, the inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, the mesothelial monocytic cardiac excrescence. We discuss also the lipomatous hypertrophy, the hamartoma of mature cardiac myocyte, we, the calcified amorphous tumor, papillary fibroelastoma, the cystic tumor of the atrioventricular node, and histiocytoid cardiomyopathy with, with focus on their differential diagnosis, gross appearance, histologic features, and some ancillary studies to differentiate this from other lesions. In addition, also, your, your histocytoid cardiomyopathy would always present also with your arrhythmia, sudden death, or cardiac disturbances, or electrical disturbances. And so most of the cases are from um, autopsy also. Um, thank you. That's all for my lecture.